I want to thank Dan and Pat for the invitation to be here. It's been an interesting couple of days, and this is a beautiful space, so I enjoy talking here. This slide is really going to be a summary of the things that I'm going to talk about. You can start up here at the top. This is increasing complexity in a disease transmission system, starting with what we call direct transmission, so that'd be from one person to another, and that would be something like influenza or measles. And then we start to get in here where we have an arthropod vector. Here's a mosquito. Adding that mosquito to the cycle is not like just adding another step to transmission. It makes the whole system much more complicated. The mosquito brings its own ecology, its own bi biology to the system. And I'll be talking mostly, I will talk some about Zika virus, but I'm going to talk mostly about dengue. And it really does kind of fall into this one mosquito species. But it can get more complicated. Most malaria transmission cycles have multiple vectors involved in them. So increasing the complexity. And then we can go all the way down here to something like West Nile virus, where there's lots of different bird species, lots of different mosquitoes involved. And occasionally, it would spill out and infect a human. That's so complicated that sometimes I don't really understand how my friends that work on that can make sense of it. So I'm going to start right in this area. And these diseases, like the ones I've listed here, malaria, uh, filariasis is elephantiasis, dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, also Zika, they take an enormous toll on human health. And our efforts to try to control them largely have not been as successful as we would like them to be. They're complicated transmission cycles. They're resilient to our efforts to try to control them. So we could ask, what are the key points in that transmission cycle that are most vulnerable to intervention, to try to prevent people from getting infected and getting sick? Should public health policy be modified, or how should public health policy be modified to account for differences in the ecology and behavior of humans? And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Mosquitoes, I'll spend some time talking about that. And then other things that you've probably heard about, like environmental change. Or when we go in and we try to control the, the system, we perturb it. How does it respond to our interference with it? The bottom line that I'm going to try to convey to you, the sort of take-home message, is that if we have an improved understanding of disease ecology, this is really quite important because that's the context in which we're making decisions about how we can improve public health policy to prevent disease. And some areas that I think are important, some ones that I would highlight, are things like movement of humans and mosquitoes, mosquito ecology and behavior. Those are two things that I'm going to spend some time talking about. Variation in the details of transmission across complex landscapes. And then how do we take all that information and interpret how humans and mosquitoes come together? Because these pathogens I'm going to be talking to you about, the mosquito has to bite a person, takes up a blood meal with the pathogen in it, goes through an incubation period, then becomes infectious and bites another person and passes it on. So the bottom line here is that if we increase our capacity to capture important aspects of transmission and integrate that across different disciplines, the interdisciplinary approach that Dan was talking about, like human ecology and social interactions, mosquito ecology, that's going to improve our capacity to prevent these diseases, the ones that have been so hard for us to get a handle on. Now, Dan did tell you I was a business major. He didn't tell you I went to college on a basketball scholarship. And it wasn't until I got to the end of, started to get to my end of my career as, as, a, as a student thinking, what do I want to do? And I ended up actually going back to school and taking science courses. Because as a business major, my father was a physicist, so I took physics. And that was actually kind of easy, because I had been around him a lot. And I took a geology course. That was the only science I had. So I took science courses for a year got into graduate school in a biology department, and the, my area of emphasis was birds and bird ecology. So like this prothornitary warbler, which you have here in Georgia, it's a beautiful bird. Um, and so when I made the transition to beyond my master's degree into my PhD, I wanted to do something that had a little bit more application than of bird behavior, and I made the connection in terms of how birds have a role in the transmission of certain pathogens. 
And the one that I started working on was Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus. That was during my um, postdoc at Yale University. This mosquito, Culicida melanura, transmits the virus between birds. Occasionally, it spills out into horses and humans and causes a severe necrotizing encephalitis. It's a very uh, nasty virus. Well, that, that was the, the system that I was working on when I was at the University of Maryland. And about four or five years into it, I thought I really wanted to get involved in something that had a, a bigger public health impact. And fortunately, this is not something that a lot of people get, because if they do, if they get infected with this, about 50% of the people will die, and the people that recover are going to have a high probability of neurologic uh, sequelae that would, they would carry with them for the rest of their life. So that's when I got into dengue. This is a map of the globe. The red areas are the places where we expect that there's high transmission of dengue. The yellow area is sort of moderate, and the green where we don't think it is at all. We estimate that about a third to over half the world's population is at risk of infection with this virus. Each year, there's about 390 million infections each year, and about 96 million of those people get sick. They get sick enough that they'd stay home from school or from going to work. So about three quarters of the people get infected, but they don't get debilitatingly infected. And one of the interesting things about dengue is it's a, it's a multi-strain pathogen. There's four different serotypes, dengue one, two, three, and four, and it's possible for you to get dengue four different times. These are, it's a, the transmission cycle is relatively simple. It's primarily this mosquito, Aedes aegypti. This is the same mosquito that transmits yellow fever, transmits chikungunya, Zika, and uh, dengue. And it transmits it to humans. So a human gets infected, circulates virus in its peripheral blood. Aedes aegypti comes and takes a blood meal, goes through that incubation, bites another person, and transmits it. This is an electron micrograph showing the, the virus. After a person is infected, they clear the infection, and then they have what we call sterilizing immunity. They're protected from reinfection with the same serotype. So I have a high antibody titer to dengue 2. I was infected at one point. I wouldn't get dengue 2 again, but I could get one, dengue 1, 3, or 4. The course of, of infection is that some people, we now know a relatively small portion, have no symptoms at all. They could have mild disease, or they could have what we call classic dengue fever. That's a fever, a headache, muscle aches, nausea and vomiting, a rash on the trunk and on the arms, pain in the joints, and the convalescence can be long. You can be sick for up to two to three months, just difficulty going up and down stairs. Now that can progress, start out like this, and then rapidly deteriorate into dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome with a reduction in platelets. And one of the key things that happens is the capillaries start to leak. So fluid is released out of the capillaries, and the cellular part of the blood starts to go increase. And if you don't correct that by intravenous fluids and electrolyte management, the person can go into shock and die. Fortunately, physicians in many parts of the world know how to manage this, so they can keep the, if you don't correct it, the mortality rate is 20 to 30%. Otherwise, you can knock it down to less than 1%. So the only way we have to control dengue right now, it's the same thing with Zika and with uh, chikungunya virus. There's no licensed vaccine. There are people that are working on a vaccine, and we may have one. It may not work as well as we would like it to. It's been difficult to develop a vaccine against four viruses at the same time. Uh, but there are, they are in the works. There's no clinical cure, so the only way we have to control dengue right now is mosquito control. And that's exactly what I was on the phone about this afternoon. There was a lot of discussion about how we could use vector control to prevent Zika here in the United States. And I think ultimately what we're going to want to do is integrate interventions, not just different types of vector control, but combine vaccines and vector control. And so there's a lot of thought going into what would be the best way to do that. The first place that I want to tell you about that I worked in is Thailand. I've worked there for about 25 years. Bangkok was the headquarters. There's a US Army lab there and a Mahidan University. We started out working in Chachin Sao and in Massat, primarily on mosquito behavior and ecology. And I'll explain to you in a little bit how I made the transition to Kampang Pet, 
where we did studies on the distribution of human infections and the evolution of interactions between mosquitoes and viruses. I'm not going to talk about that today. This is what the habitat for Aedes aegypti looks like in Thailand. This is a bathroom. So the female mosquitoes lay their eggs in places like this, or water that's stored here. It's what we call a container breeding mosquito. Aedes aegypti lives in very close association with humans. It's almost like the cockroach of the mosquito world. Water that's stored in jars like this, the larvae develop here, or water that accumulates in tires. And then when the adults emerge, they tend to go inside the house and they rest on clothing in closets and quiet places in the house. So a person walks in, they fly over and bite them and then go back. This is not a mosquito that moves very far. 100 yards would be a long distance for it to fly. And it's also a little bit unusual in the sense that it bites during the daytime. It's not biting at night. So as people are coming and going out of houses, it might be uh, feeding or biting on them. This is a house in Massat where we worked. They're open. Mosquitoes can move in and out relatively uh, freely, uh, biting people. And a female mosquito could spend her whole life inside that house and not need to move away. So in Thailand, in the places that I just showed you, these are some of the things that we did when we, when we started out. And it was really focusing on mosquito behavior. So what species does Aedes aegypti bite? That's really quite important. Because the more affinity there is for biting humans and the more frequently they do it, the greater the chance that they could bite a person that's infected with the virus. And then when they turn around and they become infectious, the more people they could transmit it to. How often do they bite? Are there certain people that get bitten more often than others? And what's the consequence of that? What does that mean in terms of transmission? So these were the kinds of questions that I was interested in. What we would do, this is one of the members of our team, is go in the houses with an aspirator and collect the mosquitoes. And the first thing we did was use a, an assay that would look at the blood in the engorged mosquito and we could tell what species they had fed on. And about 85 to 95 percent of the time they're biting a human. This is a rural setting, so occasionally they'll feed on a, a cat or a dog or a water buffalo. But primarily they're feeding on, on humans. Then we took some of those engorged mosquitoes and we sectioned them and looked at them under a microscope. And it's kind of like counting the rings on a tree. We could see how many blood meals they took. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. And what we found out from that is this mosquito is making very frequent contact with humans. Every day it's taking a blood meal. It doesn't just take one blood meal. And they take this blood meal. Well, this mosquito does it for a variety of reasons, but most mosquitoes to get the nutrients to lay their eggs. So they don't just take one blood meal and then wait three or four days, lay their eggs, and take another one. They're just making contact with humans frequently, which is really the bottom line in terms of making them a very efficient vector. And then the last thing that we did was use genetic profiling. So we used some of the same genetic markers that the FBI uses at a crime scene. There were 10 different markers that are highly variable. And so here we're taking some cells from the inside of this little guy's mouth, and we could get a genetic profile from him. And these markers were different enough that we could distinguish his genetic profile from his dad's, who's holding him there. So what we would do is get a profile for all the people that lived in the village, and then we would collect the engorged mosquitoes and determine what the profile of the blood was in the engorged mosquitoes, and we could link it back and see who's getting, or certain people getting bitten more often than others, or there's certain trends that we could see that would have some importance in terms of the transmission of dengue virus. These are a couple of slides that I really like. Um, this is three generations in the community where we worked in Thailand. This is the grandfather, the grandmother, their daughter, their daughter-in-law, and their grandchildren. And I'm going to show you some slides in a moment from Peru, another place that I've worked. This is the grandmother. These are three of her daughters and her granddaughter. So using these approaches, could we say, are there certain individuals that are bitten more often than others and therefore at greater risk of getting infected and maybe contributing more to transmission of the virus than other individuals? So we saw that Aedes aegypti feeds preferentially and frequently on human blood. And as a side note, they really benefit from this. 
Human blood has chemistry that actually means by just feeding on that blood and doing it frequently, they lay more eggs and they live longer. So there's, a, there's an advantage to them. It also explains how the virus um, can be transmitted so efficiently when there really aren't a lot of mosquitoes. If you went into one of these houses in Thailand and collected 80s aegypti and got 10 females, that would be a lot. So the population density tends to be low, but we can have explosive epidemics like you're seeing with Zika virus in Brazil. Um, it also explains how you can have clusters of infections. It's not that unusual to see a family of four or five all coming down with dengue within about 12 or 24 hours of one another. That could be a single mosquito that probed its mouth parts into each one of those individuals and infected them in a short period of time. And it helps to explain, because of this intimate contact with humans, why we get such explosive outbreaks of Aedes aegypti borne viruses. Some people are bitten more often than others. For example, I didn't show you Puerto Rico, but we did this. We did a study in Puerto Rico. There were 75 people that lived in the village. Three of those people accounted for more than half of the blood meals. So three adults were getting bitten way more than other people in the community. And if you look at this mathematically, there's reasons to believe that that kind of differential feeding on, on certain individuals actually increases the chances for the virus to get transmitted. Adults tend to be bitten more often than children. And the bad news is, for the students that are here, it's the young adults that get bitten the most. Then it's the old folks like me. And then it's the children, which is really kind of interesting because in many parts of the world, dengue is seen as a a pediatric disease, but I'll explain in a moment how that happens. In places where a virus is newly introduced and everybody is susceptible, which is what is happening, no thanks, which is what is happening in Brazil, you tend to see children not getting infected as much as adults and older people because that's how the bites are distributed, and everybody is susceptible. But when you have a place that is endemic, that is, the virus has been there for a long period of time, the adults are immune. So there's a lot of infected bites on human hosts that are protected, and they don't get infected. So they're what we call dead end. And in those situations, that's when the children become important. Um, we see that visitors to the home, I told you it's a daytime biting mosquito, people that come over to visit you or you go over to visit somebody else, there's a risk that you could, get, you could take the virus to your friend or your relative or you could bring it back from their house to yours. And what this all means is that if we're going to do vector control to prevent these diseases, as efficient as this mosquito is, is interacting with hosts, you're going to have to really knock down the mosquitoes to a low level. The threshold by which transmission ceases, it's going to be low. And, it's going to, and, and to sustain that is going to be a very difficult thing to do. So this reminds me of something that I wanted to tell you about. This wasn't where my turning point was, but it, it reminds me of this. This is a 14-year-old girl in Kampeng Pet Provincial Hospital who's recovering from dengue hemorrhagic fever. And Whenever I go to Thailand or I go to Peru, I always make it a point to go to the hospital because I want to see how the physicians are managing the cases, but I also want to be reminded that these are not numbers, they're people. This girl was in the pediatric ward, and what you can't see, and I didn't take a picture of that out of respect for the people that were involved, off to the side over here, over this direction, was a five-year-old boy with his grandmother. The five-year-old boy was comatose, and his grandmother had a look on her face just of total fear. He had a cerebral infection with Japanese encephalitis. It's another mosquito-borne virus. And in this part of the world, it's not unusual for people to, these are family members here sitting with this young woman, for a family member to stay with someone in the hospital. And I had two postdocs with me who were really talented, quantitative guys. They'd been looking at a lot of data. And I said, I want you to look at this, because this is why we're doing this. We want to try to improve public health for people who suffer from these diseases. My turning point wasn't quite that abrupt. When I was doing those mosquito feeding experiments, I just got to a point where I didn't feel like 
I could be going into people's homes and collecting these mosquitoes like it's some sort of an ecology experiment. I really wanted to try to do something to try to help them. And that's when I made the transition to doing more epidemiological studies, studying patterns and processes of transmission. So now we move to uh, Thailand. Did I skip a slide? No. Nope. Okay. Um, this is in northwestern Thailand, and this is in Kampang Pet. And the idea that we were testing here was that dengue transmission is very local and focal. So if we detected an infection with, in one of these children, and we went to the community where they lived, we'd expect to see other children infected living in houses very close to them. That was the, the hypothesis. And this is what the study design looked at like. We monitored their atten attendance at school. We had somebody that went to the classroom every day. If they were absent, we went to their home. If they had a fever, we drew blood from them. And we had a PCR assay that could tell us within 24 hours if they had dengue. If they did, we came back. And we went out to 100 meters. And we recruited from these houses in red 10 to 25 additional children that we drew blood from on that day and two weeks later to determine if they were infected at the beginning or they got infected during that two-week period. What we also did was collect mosquitoes. And in addition, so we could do a comparison, we started these sorts of geographic clusters with children that had a fever but didn't have dengue. So that was the control. And this is what the results look like. So over a four-year period, we had children that initiated clusters from all four dengue serotypes a total of almost 100 of these clusters, and whether we determined that the child was infected by detecting antibody or viral RNA, you can see in gray, it's much higher for the positive clusters than for the negatives. Basically what this saying, and we were actually surprised at this. We, we picked 100 meters because we thought that was about as far out as we could go and, and handle all the work that we needed to do. But within 100 meters, these infections, both the mosquitoes and the humans, were clustered within that, that really small little area. This is an example of what one of those clusters looked like. This was a child here that was infected with dengue 4 in 2004. That's the actual distribution of the houses. The black dots represent the additional children that we recruited. And if there's a mosquito in the roof, that meant that we collected a female Aedes aegypti there. And the number in the chimney is how many we collected. These indicate, these pink and blue dots indicate children that we detected virus in their blood during either the day 0 or day 15 blood draw. Here's where infected mosquitoes were in red. And then here in red were children that we determined by detecting antibodies that they had become infected. So in this particular cluster, 60% of the children were infected in a two-week period. Only 5% of the mosquitoes that we could detect were infected. That's consistent with what I was talking about before. This mosquito, you don't have to have many of them, and they can infect a lot of people. Infected people and mosquitoes were clustered in less than 100 meters. There was a greater risk overall in these cluster studies. If you, if you lived within 100 meters of somebody who had dengue, your chances of getting dengue went way up. And if you have these little hot spots of transmission, how do those things get started? And, and if you look across Thailand, you see reports of dengue throughout the whole country. Well, it could be that mosquitoes fly short distances, but it's much more likely that people are moving from one cluster going to another and introducing the virus into that location. And the connection between these little hot spots, it's almost like you light a match on a map, and the match burns, and then it burns down, and it goes out. Another match lights here and burns out. This constant flickery. That's connected by human movement and human interaction. Now we're going to go to Peru. The study site is uh, the city of Iquitos. And it's located right up here in the northeast corner of the Amazon basin of Peru. This is Iquitos. This is the city. This is the Amazon River right here. So it's an ecological island in the Amazon basin. Uh, here we have done a little bit different kind of cluster study that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. It's not based on geography. And we have longitudinal cohorts. So we have had since 1999, and we have funding to go through two. 
2019, I think it'll more likely 2020, we've had a group of about 2,500 people that we draw blood from six, every six to 12 months so we can study across time what their exposure is to the virus. Iquitos is an isolated city. It's only accessible by air or boat. There's no roads into the city. The population is about 370 people and has a well-characterized history of the introduction of dengue viruses from 1990 to 2010, and right now it's primarily dengue 2, a little bit of dengue 1 that's circulating. This is what the habitat looks like in Iquitos. This is somebody's backyard with buckets, barrels. Iquitos gets the, gets the rainforest. They get three meters of rain a year. So you leave something out in the backyard, it's going to fill up with water. Here's 55-gallon drums. These are the places where Aedes aegypti lay their eggs, the back of this toilet. And then when the adults emerge, they go inside the houses. Oftentimes the house has no back to it. It'll have like a little roof that comes out. They can freely and easily move in and out and rest in here. This is actually a mosquito net that's used more for Culex mosquitoes rather than human malaria because they're such a, such a pest. And this is a picture of downtown Iquitos, with people moving about. And what we wondered from the, from the Thai studies, we had these real tight foci, we wondered, well, can we quantify, can we actually understand better how those are connected to one another? So how do people mix with mosquitoes across a, a landscape like this? And we did that in two ways. Well, first of all, what we wanted to do was characterize what we call an activity space. Those are the places that we go on a regular basis. And if you think about that, we're really not that unique. You know, we think we are, but we actually go pretty much to the same places each day. We aren't going to that many different places. Can we characterize the places that people go, what their exposure is to mosquitoes, when do they go to those places, and how does that relate to patterns of transmission? The first thing that we did was what we called prospective activity space. We interviewed people, like this is a member of our team interviewing this housewife, asking her, on a, on a regular basis, where, what places do you go? And which of those places do you think you'd get bitten by mosquitoes? And then we verified that by putting GPS units on people. So this is one in a person's hand, and this guy has it around his neck. And what we did was we had about 600 participants we recorded where they were every two and a half minutes for 15 days. We turned them off at night because Aedes aegypti isn't biting at night, and it made the batteries last a little bit longer. I ended up with almost two and a half million GPS units, and each one of these yellow dots is a reading for where a person was. The people lived in these two communities, so the black dots are their houses. And then you can see all the different places they went, including the road down here, which goes to a town south of, of Iquitos. So this allowed us to characterize a healthy person, doesn't have dengue, what kind of places did they go to, how many of them are there, where do we think that they would get exposed. And then we did something that we called retrospective. This was based on people that had dengue, somebody that actually was infected. And we said, well, where did you go in the last two, I'm sorry, we have about 5,000 people that we monitor three days a week. We have nurses that go to their homes and ask them if anybody in the, in the house has a fever. If they do, we draw blood. If it's dengue, we come back and we say, where did you go in the last two weeks? Then we go to those places and we draw blood from as many people as we can there. So this is called an activity space cluster. Rather than limiting it just to that little area around where they live, we're looking at the places that they visited. And this figure gives you a sense of how people travel. These people are really quite poor, but they move a lot. So these are the two neighborhoods that we studied, the red and the blue. And you can see that they moved around within their neighborhoods. But in some cases, they went four, this is a, a kilometer right here, they went four or five kilometers away. So we saw that more people were infected in contact cluster houses then, and we did the same thing as we had before. We had people that had a fever but didn't have dengue, went to the places they went to, and there weren't nearly as many, many people that were infected there. For every apparent infection, so somebody that got, was sick and would seek a doctor, there were approximately five other infected people. Four of them, we never would have known they were out there. 
if we hadn't been doing this. We wouldn't have known they were infected. They weren't sick. Infections spread across four houses. One was the index person's house. One was close, a neighbor. And then the other two were beyond 100 meters, and they could be kilometers away. So the distance that was visited didn't influence risk. I had always kind of, this is a different way of thinking about this. I had always sort of thought about the spatial dimensions of transmission. What this is saying is it's social proximity. How close are you related socially to someone? Your grandmother, your girlfriend, your brother, you go and, and visit them. Rather than how close do they live to you? Somebody could live two houses away, but if you don't visit them, there's really no risk there. So this was really kind of a, a, an interesting twist. I'm not saying that distance doesn't play a role. But this is saying that a lot of the things that we see in terms of transmission within a city are driven by human social interactions rather than the, the physical distance. There was movement overlap. If you participated in, the, in this activity space of a person that was infected, your chances of getting infected went up. Human mobility was key in defining the risk of an individual patterns of local transmission. This is how, when, when we, we have seen introductions of virus into Iquitos. A new virus comes in, and we're monitoring it so we can see it. It comes in, and it spreads real quickly throughout the city at a very low level. The public health system wouldn't know it was there if we weren't doing research there. And then, so it's there at a low level. The next year, when the transmission system picks up, the thing just explodes. So that explains how that's happening. And at a, co a collective or a population level, it's the social connections that are important, the routine movements that we have to the same places. And in Iquitos, schools are not all that important, and I can explain that if, you, if you're interested. But in Iquitos, it's the homes of family and friends that you visit that determine your risk. So then we thought, well, is everybody the same? Or aren't there, might there be differences in people? And so what we wanted to look at is how do people vary, not just in how they move, but how they contribute to transmission. So we wanted to look at what happens with regard to disease, where they have no disease or severe disease. And we had some colleagues at the uh, Pasteur Institute in Paris that were uh, working in Cambodia, and so we decided to go there to do this study. This is a little boy who was determined to be infected with dengue virus, and you can see right here this carton here and here. There's mosquitoes in there, and they're feeding on his legs. And so basically what we wanted to do was identify people that had very mild disease, more severe disease, and see how infectious they are to mosquitoes. How, to what extent do they transmit virus to mosquitoes? And what we saw is people with no symptoms at all, and that's really like 10%. It's really a relatively small number. Most people have some symptoms. They might not get that sick, but they have some symptoms. The people with no symptoms at all do infect mosquitoes. At a given level of virus in their blood, the people with no symptoms or the people that started to circulate virus in their blood before they got sick actually were more infectious to the mosquitoes than the people that were down here and were sick when we fed the mosquitoes on them. So you have this sort of silent reservoir of people going about their daily routine. They don't feel sick at all. They're going and visiting people, and they're taking the virus. They go over to their grandmother's house. The mosquitoes bite them there. They've introduced the virus into that location. So these people who don't have symptoms or are circulating virus before the symptoms show up, this indicates that they're probably playing we don't know for sure, but they're probably playing a much more significant role than we thought they were. This is really relevant to Zika. You've listened to some of the things on the news and so forth. Zika virus, only maybe one in five people that gets infected gets sick. So the bulk of the people have no symptoms at all. And I would suspect that the same thing's happening with them. Those people don't get sick, but they're contributing to transmission. What we're doing now as a follow-up this is a, a man in Iquitos, and he's got mosquitoes feeding on his leg. And we're looking at how people contribute to a greater extent along this disease spectrum. But we also have a medical doctor, a clinician, who's helping us define what is the severity of disease.
And he's working closely with social scientists that are saying, if you get really sick, does that modify your behavior? So that it changes it in ways so that you don't interact with mosquitoes as much as if you were uh, healthy or didn't feel sick at all. And then the last project is a mathematical modeling project that brings those two things together to see how this affects the dynamics of transmission and how it might affect how we set up surveillance systems. If we want to try to detect that there's a threat, but most of the people are healthy and we can't detect them, are we way behind the curve? Or should we do something preemptively to try to prevent it before it starts? So we probably could stop there and I could summarize things, but then Zika came along. Zika virus was discovered in Uganda in 1947. It's a flavivirus, so it's very closely related to dengue, to West Nile, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis. Um, it remained in Africa and Asia until about 2013, 2014, when it was recovered from a small island, Yap, in the Federated States of Micronesia, followed by an eastward progression through the French Polynesia. In 2015, possibly 2014, but it was confirmed in 2015, it was in Latin America. Presently, it's in 26 countries and territories. It has not taken long for it to spread the extent that it has. In South and Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean, Virgin Islands, and it is a significant problem right now in Puerto Rico, a US territory. For the people that do get sick, and most of them don't, 80% don't, it's a fever, a rash, joint pains, and pain in your eyes. It's typically the person doesn't get as sick as they do with dengue. Now, if this was the end of the story, we really, and, and we really probably wouldn't be worrying too much about Zika virus. It wasn't until this came about, microcephaly became part of the equation. And the Brazilian government and the CDC is working with the Brazilian government to really try to determine if, in fact, Zika is causing microcephaly. And there is a body of evidence that is increasingly indicating that it is and that there may be actually more pathology associated uh, with this virus than just microcephaly. Microcephaly is a congenital neurodevelopment disorder with a reduced head size. The head fails to grow, but the face does grow normally and it results in significant um, sequelae for the children that are infected. They have delayed motor function and speech. There can be hyperactivity and intellectual disability. So it really is a, is a tragic and debilitating circumstance. This is what has elevated Zika to such a high level in terms of public health concern. This is a map that shows the countries where Zika is currently. And the dark red is where it has been reported, and the light red are places where it has been reported in the past. Um, and the clear, these gray areas are where we don't think that it would, we would find it. It wouldn't be sustainable. This is an interesting uh, a figure that talks a little bit about, it talks about human movement, but at a much different scale. I was talking to you about movement just within a community. In a, in a, Iquitos is about 10 kilometers long and about two or three wide. This is about continents. What this group did was they mapped out places in orange where they thought that Zika virus could be transmitted year round. Then in yellow are places that they thought maybe just during the summer months when things are warm it could be transmitted. So the, the risk of transmission is a little bit lower. And then in the white areas where they didn't think it would happen at all. And then these circles indicate the larger the circle, the more people from Brazil are flying into that city. Brazil right now is an epicenter for Zika. So what this is indicating is where are the places that we think might be receptive for the introduction of the virus? And where might the virus be introduced by people that are flying in? So if you look up here in Florida, it's orange. Orlando and Miami have big circles around them. So that is a place that it could conceivably be introduced. Whereas in Santiago, Chile, there's a lot of Brazilians that go there, but we don't think the transmission would take place there. This is something that we can use in terms of where should we be looking for introduction and transmission to pl take place in the United States or in other places in, in Latin America. 
This is a, another map uh, of a paper that's currently in review of where we think in the world it would be receptive to Zika virus based on environmental factors, places that we think that Aedes aegypti would be present. So this is the map of the world right here where it's red, there's a very high probability, where it's green, gray, there's a very low one. And then these panels show different continents. For the United States, of course, Puerto Rico, uh, Florida, along the Gulf states and southern Texas are places that we really should be concerned about. And Hawaii, which is not on the map. So what are some of the conclusions that we can draw from this? In terms of fine-scale understanding of transmission of these sorts of viruses, they define the details for virus transmission and they have important implications for prevention. Human movement at those fine scales is key for determining the risk that somebody's going to get infected, the infection patterns, and it sort of drives the dynamics that we see in these infections. At an individual level, infection is defined by contact in the places that you visited, contact with mosquitoes that were present in those locations. And they're not everywhere. It's another thing that's really tricky about this mosquito. You can have a house that has a lot of mosquitoes. You come back a month later and there's none at all. It's moved to someplace else. It's just like that match analogy I gave you. It's the same thing with the mosquitoes. They're popping up and, and popping down. In terms of a population level, transmission is shaped by the overlapping movement of people. What, how socially connected are they to one another? The details of the human and mosquito behavior are something that's actually really quite important for informing mathematical models. And this is an important tool because we want to try to understand better the dynamics of transmission. But we also want to look at what, what are the ways that we can interfere? How could we use vector control? How could we use a vaccine? There, I don't have a slide of it here, but the WHO recommend, the World Health Organization, recommends up to 40 different types of vector control for Aedes aegypti. Which one do you use? The vaccines, there's one that's pretty far along. There's maybe four or five that are coming.